Okay, welcome to today's Zoom meeting, and we are blessed and honored to be hosting world-renowned astrologer and visionary of the soul, Aaron Sullivan. Aaron is the author of six astrological books, including Saturn and Transit, Planets, and Astrology of Family Dynamics, to name a few. Today, Aaron is going to talk about the outer planets as agents of consciousness, and as a quote, interpreting the agent agency of the outer planets with Pluto in sharp focus, Aaron will talk about what now in the times we are in and what we are facing, how we might personally and in that way collectively work through what may prove to be the most significant time in human history. Aaron, we're very happy to have you here. Welcome. And you can share your screen by uh, hitting that green button at any time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, great. Now, um, okay, options in consciousness. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And we're going to include the USA chart because it happens to be in bristling with activity. And right now, I'm just going to show you one of my favorite um, little photos, pictures I plucked off the internet. And it's a world, the whole world, as we, as we, you know, imagine it without boundaries, without, you know, bombs going off. I mean, there's so many images of the world now. We can, we can actually see, you know, people walking around on their own property. It's quite fascinating. But the, the, uh, the, the, best, the point of the talk today, and it's a foreshortened one because it has been, you know, as long as a two-hour seminar, but I think that we can go, I'll skip through a few of my slides, but indeed, the very minute that Uranus was sighted, everything changed, because until that happened, we had um, a very, you know, millennial, many millennial old system dating back into the Chaldeans, and even before, if nobody noticed it, but we had planets that were visible between you know our earth out to the boundary of saturn the minute that uranus was sighted everything changed and that's why i like to call that the day the world changed and i've just put in here a pretty basic little diagram but still you know visuals are always more impactful to the psyche than words are and what we ended up with is when Uranus was sighted, it usurped the planet Saturn. And then when Neptune was sighted, it usurped Jupiter's position of the 12th house ruler. And when Pluto was finally sighted in 1930, it usurped after a great struggle, the planet Mars's position as ruler of Scorpio. And so we noticed that it was such a tidy little picture. We had Saturn, Saturn, Jupiter, Jupiter, Mars, Mars, Venus, Venus, Mercury, Mercury, Sun, Moon and Sun, Mom and Dad, and the kids. And all of a sudden, we get these something really going on. And it's every century from the sighting of Uranus, a new planet was sighted. We'll get into the funniness of oddities of Neptune in a bit. I'm going to just put this one up very briefly because I actually have it in another slide where we'll see more dynamic. But I just wanted to point out that um, each sighting awakened a sleeping archetype in the collective unconscious. And global transits will activate the collective mood and events. And when transiting your chart, your individual chart, each of these planets will invoke through stages new levels of consciousness, of awareness, and they will last for a lifetime. These are not, you know, like a five-minute, you know, transit of Mars and you cut your, your finger. It's, it's not a mood. It's a life-changing event. People say, oh, oh, right, Uranus is uh, transiting my sun and, and when's it going to be over? That's a very typical question, isn't it? Well, it's over, but it's never really over because you will spend the rest of your life individuating, becoming increasingly more of who you are, through the agencies of each of these planets as they 
come to consciousness in your own chart. Options in consciousness. Now, I, I'm just going to sort of paraphrase a lot of this. It's been said that the outer planets are transpersonal, which, um, you know, after 45 plus years of, of, you know, really, really doing astrology, I mean, just, just practicing, playing, studying, reading, um, you know, writing books. I mean, there's no better way to learn something to, to have to, than to have to actually, um, you know, go through the agony and the ecstasy of verbalizing what it is that you're seeing and how to do that. And so we don't, you know, we only know Uranus in full because it's had like about four, well, light here, Uranus. It's been around the sun, therefore, in our horoscopes, four times and 047 months, um, for four times. So we actually know Uranus transits. We, we, ha we can look back. But we can also look back like Tarnas did in his book, um, in Cosmos Sun Psyche, where you can look back even before they were sighted, and you'll see some in interesting things about the United States chart. And we can, we can actually see what he was coming, you know, during these transits. But when we get to the, um, to the other planets, like, um, you know, I mean, we've known Uranus for 340 years. We've known Neptune for 169 years. Only one full cycle, because it's about 155. And what it's very interesting about Neptune when we get into the United States horoscope, and generally speaking, and then in Pluto, in 1930, we saw Pluto. So we only have a half cycle of Pluto. We only know half of what Pluto does consciously in our mind as we see it go back through time. And I think that if we want to truly explore the intentions as the archetype of the planet, we don't necessarily want to look at it as something that is uh, fixed and sentient, but more as an agent in its action. I'm putting this chart up by accident. So I'm going to go next and just talk a bit about the, very quickly, about the power of outer planets. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. This diagram I, I whisked out of the uh, um, planetary complexes by Dane Ridger. And I love it because it, it, there's nothing, as I said, more descriptive than a diagram. Every outer planet is almost like half the time retrograde. We know about the inner planets and their they're wonderful cycles, they're, and they're very quick, and they happen, you know, Venus every 18 months, it goes retrograde, we're going to have one coming up in the next year. And uh, the uh, transit of, of Mercury is, you know, every three months, sorry, every four months, we get Mercury retrograde, so we get kind of used to it, and then we get shocked when it comes. But when you're looking at these outer planets, look, at Uranus is 41% of the time retrograde. Neptune 43 percent of the time, and Pluto 44 to 55, and it's growing because it's elongating in its orbit, as you will see. And so these planets will awaken in stages aspects of our own personal collective relationship, and also in tandem with what's going on in the outer world. Another very quick look, because I want to move into interpretation more. This is just a diagram that's in Retrograde Planets, my book, that describes the two ways that we get three passes of each outer planet. You can either have it go up, stop, go retrograde, go direct, go back over the planet degree, stop, go retrograde, and then station direct on the same exact degree. This one happened to be of one Capricorn, uh, which happens to be where the moon, you know, that was in the beginning of when I wrote the book. And then, or you can have it pass over once, station direct, pass over again, and then pass over again. Not stationing on each of the, of the degree, the single degree that we're concerned about. Like say your moon is, you know, 21 degrees of Aries. 
you'll find, for example, that Uranus at this point is going about, about to make its final passage as it stations direct at 21 degrees over your natal moon. So there are three phases of, of conscious um, experience. And the first one is the first hit, which is apparently not a great word to use, but it still is. It's shock and awe. It's like, oh my God, the first pass of an outer planet is usually preceded by a kind of instinctive, there's something going on. I feel that I, I am about to undergo some massive change. I, I, I think in terms of it as a kind of rumbling deep in the psyche that leads up to a potent change. But it can begin a process that lives anywhere from excitement to panic to desire to make an immediate change, which you should never do. That's my always my advice. Just hang in there. Wait for the second pass, which happens to be one gestation cycle later. Um, the beauty of retrograde planets um, from Saturn outward is that they have nine-month periods of gestation. They will hit a degree, they move backwards, and then they move forwards, and they pass over that degree eight and a half months later. So it's very, very similar to a human gestation cycle. So it's, there's an awareness of what's actually going on in your psyche and in your personal world around you. And, it, and, and the second passage over the single degree that it will is a time frame in which we have a, a, a lot of knowledge, but no real sense of understanding what's going on. And it's a kind of period of liminality, which literally means being in the threshold. The third and final pass of an outer planet over one of your natal planets in transit, the transit of the outer planet, it actually brings a, a kind of aha, oh, I get it. I, I, I actually see what's really happening. Um, I understand the process of what I have been going through and calling the astrologer about. And it actually has resulted in a complete and utter change in perception, which doesn't mean that you've changed shapes or you have to get a new order, but it does mean that you are now beginning a time in your life where your life has changed percept percep you know, perceptively, perceptively and on many levels. And consciousness does consider to cons continue to process this for a lifetime. As of now, Pluto is elongating and it's moving more slowly. And so we actually will end up with sometimes five, six, and as we increase along the ecliptic, as Pluto continues to elongate longer and longer stations. So, but, okay, Pluto was in Scorpio for 12 years, right? Remember, well, when we entered Scorpio, we discovered AIDS, etc., And it was 12 years long. By the time it gets out against the backdrop of the zodiac, it will actually spend 32 years in Taurus. Now, I, for one, am really glad that I'm not going to be around them <laughs> because I think that 10 years was darn long enough to go over all my Scorpio planets. I'm going to move ahead. Okay, now this is a quickie because it also will reappear. Notice that every single time one of the outer planets was sighted, the moon was in Scorpio. And it was also involved with the, the nodes. Moon in Scorpio, north node, discovery of Pluto. Moon in Nep uh, discovery of Neptune, moon, Pluto, moon north node, and discovery of Uranus. I would say that's close enough. The south node is in Scorpio, and the moon is in Scorpio. And Scorpio was rising at the time, because they did have an exact time. So we have Pluto and Saturn also dominant in every discovery. This is leading towards something. See, we have Saturn and Mars, but Saturn is opposite to Uranus, but it's also involved by... Um, the relationship to Pluto 
in the third house at six Aquarius, which is squared by the node and the moon. Okay, so we've got a Saturn Pluto link. It's not as strong as it gets as we get into, um, I'm gonna have to move this. When we get into the discovery of Neptune, and this is a fabulous one because you know Neptune is well, things like gas and invisible and you, know, you can't see it and etc. cetera. Um, it, it's almost as if it took Saturn and Neptune to come together in exactly the same degree and a few, well, you know, half a degree apart um, in order for it to harness, if you will, Neptune so that Neptune would have um, a container. An example of this, you know, um, I have several examples of various important events that take place in the discoveries, but one of them is, is that, um, you know, they discovered uh, that you could use lead cylinders, Saturn, to contain gas. Yeah, so they could use it as an anesthetic. So it was a healing me mechanism. But we also have, um, that's really significant, it, of course, the moon and the north node. Both of them are close together. It must take the the kind of mystery or secret um, secrecy for something to go on, but we also to discover. But we also see Pluto actually on the south node, okay, and the planet Saturn happens to be in a sextile. That's not that common. If we look to the discovery of Pluto itself, and there was a major uproar about this one. In fact, they're, they're always uproaring about it. You know, the male scientists get into a room and they decide they don't like it. Well, uh, too bad because it is, of course, a hugely feminine planet. And this has always been a problem in the male dominated society that has existed for millennia. So what have we got here? But we've got Saturn opposite Pluto and it's square to Uranus, but the Saturn opposite to Pluto is that they're actually conjunct their own nodal axes, and we'll go there really soon. And there we have the moon conjunct the south node. So in 2018 to 2010, Pluto and Saturn are actually going to be conjunct in longitude and on each other's nodal axes, which is a repeat of 1931 and 1932, and we'll go there in a bit. So just a little bit about Uranus. I mean, Uranus was the consort of Gaia. She had created some of her own offspring when she was born out of the ethers, or basically out of Eros. And and self-created um, uh, Uranus. She had him surround her with love and stars and the heavens, and he became her consort. And they actually inseminated and impregnated um, children. And these children were, well, they had 100 hands and 50 heads, and they were monstrous. And Uranus didn't like them. And you know, he really didn't. And so, you know, Gaia employed her eldest son, Kronos, um, to do something about it. Because after all, any woman who's ever had a baby or knows anyone who's had a baby, there's a point at which you just can't believe it's ever going to be over. I mean, you've just got to deliver. And she had reached this point, And every mother loves her children, you no know, regardless of what they look like, hundred hands or not. Uranus is, you know, an elitist. He's the heavens. She hired or, you know, gave an adamant sickle to Saturn, Kronos, and he reached up one night as Uranus lay around Gaia, longing for love, as it says in Hesiod, and castrated him. And from that castration resulted some very significant gods. One of was uh, the Panthe. Uh, uh, was um, Aphrodite, um, and the other were the Furies. The blood of the semen of the castration fell to the earth, and the uh, 
the seaman fell into the Cypriot Sea and uprose Aphrodite in all of her astounding glory because she is a motherless son. She is the a daughter. She is the one who actually is her father's daughter right to the end, all through mythologies. The other thing about Uranus is interesting is, is that in its physicality, aside from mythology and the astrology, is it, it's badly behaved. It doesn't organize itself the same way as, you know, all the other planets do. It actually rotates retrograde and its poles are pointing away from the sun. So it's extremely eccentric, which is why it does fit the physicality of a planet, does fit the archetypal and emotional relational aspect of the astrological body that we use. We get to Neptune. Now, Neptune, um, the sighting of Neptune was really interesting because there were three sightings, two sightings of Neptune by Galileo in the 1600s. And he thought it was a fixed star. I'm going to pass on. See, poor devil. He, he was, you know, this guy, you've got to read a book. By the way, let me give you a book to read. It's called, um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. The book is called um, Galileo's Daughter, and it's by Davis Sobel. She also wrote a book called Longitude, which is absolutely gripping, and everyone should read it. It's really an important book. It's a thin book, but Galileo's Daughter is a thick book, and it's the whole story of Galileo. His daughters, both of them, were in uh, the Poor Clares, which is... Which, um, uh, convent, which is the sisters of the um, Franciscan monks, or yeah, the Franciscans. And so, you know, she was very attached to her father. And so this is an incredible story about Galileo and what his whole entire very detailed life was like. So I, I do wish you would read that one. When you read these things, you, you actually understand a bit more even about how astrology itself works. Now, this is what I, I put this here, where Neptune was seen, uh, sort of now you see it, now you don't. Now, doesn't that sound like a Neptunian kind of uh, image? Well, so once it was seen in December of 1612, twice it was January of, of, um, of, of uh, 1613, and on the third time, it was in 1836. And I've just got this beautiful... Um, Sufic, Ottoman, beautiful uh, text that they use. They're surreal. And, and it's about just being out there in the universe, being, you know, turning and turning and dancing and, and just being in a very, very cosmic kind of spiritual relationship with the self and the environment not being um, that clearly defined. When we get into Nept Pluto, we get into a place where um, we're looking at a love story. And I've always had quite a lot of sympathy for Pluto, uh, Hades, because of he and his brothers, Poseidon and Zeus, after the Titanic War and the Olympians took charge, um, there was a, a, a kind of, you know, these three fellows were standing around going, well, you know, who's going to rule what? And so they say, okay, well, let's draw straws. So they do. And so Poseidon draws the straw, the long straw, and it's the sea. And... Um, so Poseidon and Zeus draws the middle straw, which is to rule the heavens, the sky, the sky, not the heavens. And Pluto rules, uh, draws a short straw and gets the underworld. So that's where he gets his, his bad name. And we have more moons of Pluto now. 
Um, but it was cited on February the 18th, 1930 by Clyde Tombeau, who's a very typical looking scientist. I rather like his little nerdy self and that massive telescope when you think of it. Um, and so when we got, uh, I'm going to go back to that. Notice that Pluto, I mentioned it before, Pluto and Taurus, 33 years in Scorpio for 12. Um, so that means each of our generations, say from Pluto and Leo, which is my generation, there are still Pluto and Cancer people around. But all notice how, how late um, the midlife square occurs, because that's a very important part of the midlife cycle. Uh, it's, it's actually exactly, um, in a sense, parallel to the Uranus opposition, um, which also is anywhere from, say, 37 to 45. But Pluto's movement um, is actually really very uh, drastic in that people have to get through the midlife if you're born with, say, Cancer or Leo. Yeah, Leo, Virgo. There, you've got a midlife going on there. Libra and Scorpio, 40 to 41, 36 to 37. Um, and Uranus was in Gemini when my midlife occurred in at the age of 37. So these outer planets, um, particularly Uranus, and Neptune is absolutely exact. It, ne it doesn't fluctuate. It's always exactly at the same age. Now I'm looking at Pluto um, and its orbit. Now that's to indicate to you one thing, and that is, is that as it extends out on its 17 degree orbital axis, it takes a longer time apparently to, to pass through a zodiacal sign. And the last, you know, and it's moved inside the orbit of Neptune regularly. And the last one we'll, we'll remember was 1999 when it left. And um, so it was there between 1979 and 1999, which was 20 years, it became a planet inside. And it wasn't until 1978 that Charon, who happens to be, of course, the boatman who ferries you across the river Styx, then what you end up with is an exceptionally eccentric, but not non-solar system, planetary pattern. So it, it, it actually does fit in. It's not at all, you know, uh, like an asteroid. It doesn't fly in and out. It is trapped inside the sun's family of planets. But it is a very important one because it deviates. This is the theme of Pluto conjoining its own nodes. Now, I have to move this. Notice that it takes, um, hmm, yeah, it says here like 37 years to actually go through. I have to use two pair of glasses. I didn't remember this yet. It's 87 years that it spends moving around before it intersects its own nodal axis, and 161 years for it to do that again. Now, the thing of it is, is that in the last century, and I mentioned, I mentioned this before, and I'll bring it up again going back, is that Pluto and Saturn um, have a kind of interesting relationship astrologically, but also mythically. And the nodal axes, seeing as the evolutionary astrology focus is very much involving nodes, I found this to be quite profound. And that's at the Saturn South Node um, in the last century was from 17 Cancer to 29 Cancer. It, it's still in that zone. 
And this Pluto south node is 17 Capricorn to 21 Capricorn. So Saturn and Pluto are lining up with their own nodal axes between, well, about now, say 2019, it's moving uh, into the Capricorn Cancer axis through 2020. And it's, but, it, but the better part of this is it, that it's conjunct Saturn and its own nodal axis. So the Saturn Pluto will actually be on each other's nodal axes again. And as it was in, um, in 1930. Now, I was looking at some interesting aspects of those time frames because I want to go back and talk about how these planets will help you understand more about yourself in these three stages. But the, the, the nodal axis of Saturn and Pluto, both conjoining in Capricorn and Cancer, oh, they take forever to, to shift. You can check it, check them. But the south node always seems to represent that which is most familiar to us. And the north node, I mean, there's the kind of thing you can just fall into really easily, um, you know, whether it's suffering or cake, you know. Um, but the north node is something that we have to strive towards, that we reach towards, and we're looking really towards something that wants to be learned, needs to be absorbed into the psyche for individuation. And the ultimate challenge, really, is to try and balance both sides. I mean, an opposition is, in fact, um, a, a split conjunction. And so when we're looking at the nodal axis. People always say, well, it's on the north node. And I'm going, it's on the axis of the north and south node. Conjunct the north node. I really need to make that always very clear. The Capricorn Cancer axis seems to represent a lot more about territorialism. When we look at the U.S. chart, you're going to see this. Territorialism, the love of home, family, tribal affinities, it's based in the feminine archetype of the Great Mother, the North Node in Cancer. And since evolution is a very slow and gradual process, the nodes move very slowly. We don't leap from one epoch into another. I mean, it's certainly a more feminine, balanced, and inquiring, nurturing archetype could actually mean um, a gentler and more feeling tone to all of life difficulties and decisions. Some may actually call this whole period of time that we're entering, and I think it seems, you know, you're, you read the news, you've got your iPhone, you know what's going on, that there is a return of the feminine or the goddess which follows millennia of patriarchal domination. And interestingly, Pluto was discovered in 1930, as you saw, just as it conjoined its own North Node in Cancer and was squared by Saturn. And it was in that time frame in 1931 and 32, where Pluto and Cancer opposed uh, Saturn and Capricorn on both their nodal axes. And a lot of the political events in the early 30s shaped the future of the world that we know now, and particularly in the United States, but it is a global phenomenon. For example, Hitler gaining German citizenship and becoming ch a chancellor of the country. This is not an accident. Whereas it's then polarized by Gandhi being in the midst of his revolution to free India and Pakistan from colonial rule and passive um, uh, passive aggression, basically. In other words, how to get what you want by not fighting. Erin, we have one minute left. Okay. And then we ended up with, um, in the 1930s, we had J. Edgar Hoover, who was a closeted cross-dresser, transvestite. We had uh, the House on American Activities followed on from that. Uh, Hoover's ascendant was his, his uh, Mercury was um, five degrees, ascendant was three degrees, and his Venus was 10 degrees, and Venus was 18 Capricorn. And so the transiting nodal axis were all on his planets, with Pluto coming up for, uh, to transit that. And so the whole, you know, all of the whole downline between that leads us into thinking, well, what's going to happen between 2019 and 2020, when Pluto and Saturn will conjunct each other around the 21st degree of Capricorn, exactly on their own shared south node.